our society is supercharged to reward us for engaging in behaviors that are not generally supportive of health. A lot of research is focused on, you know, how does mindfulness change a state? And then there's folks looking at how it changes traits, like around emotion regulation. But I think the hidden jackpot, essentially for all of our health, is if we can figure out and understand how we can align mindfulness to actually start to change our capacity to initiate healthy behaviors and to be able to reduce unhealthy behaviors. Welcome to Mind and Life. I'm Wendy Hasenkamp. It's great to be back in your feeds, and I'm very happy to be bringing you this conversation today with Zev Schumann-Olivier. Zev is the founding director of the Center for Mindfulness and Compassion at the Cambridge Health Alliance and an associate professor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. His work focuses on integrating mindfulness and compassion into healthcare systems and developing programs to help with addiction, depression, and chronic illness. He's also been increasingly interested in how these practices can help us change our behavior, which is, of course, a central and often overlooked factor in our health. Zev's also a psychiatrist, so he brings in a lot of experience from that world as well. As you'll hear, we get into a great discussion about internal family systems, which is a popular approach these days in therapy settings that has a lot of interesting alignment with Buddhist theory and contemplative practice. I love how in all of this work, Zev keeps a focus on inclusivity and trauma-informed care. And in the episode, he shares some of the steps involved in making these programs truly accessible, particularly for diverse and marginalized groups. I came away from this conversation so impressed with Zev's work in the world. He's been in the trenches of the U.S. healthcare system and all its complexity for well over a decade and has developed some really impactful programs. And as you'll hear, he also has personal experience dealing with chronic illness. And so he's done a lot of his own explorations around how mindfulness and compassion can be critical for healing. I hope you really enjoy this. I know I did. It's a pleasure to share with you, Zev Schumann-Olivier. Well, I'm so happy to be here with Zev Schumann-Olivier today. Zev, thanks for being here. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be a part of this. I really like to start with some context about how people get into the work uh, that they're doing. So could you share a little bit about how you came into the space of integrating mindfulness into healthcare settings and your interest in mental health, both from a research side and a, and a clinical side? I'd be happy to do that. Um, I guess it really starts actually with, uh, with mindfulness and with meditation. And for me, I was a medical student in my, uh, between my second and third year of medical school and then decided to go on a 10-day Vipassana meditation retreat. And I came back from that 10-day retreat, which was primarily body scanning meditation, feeling completely different than I had previously. And um, I went straight into my trauma surgery rotation where I worked wow. 90 to 100 hours a week. This was the year before the rules changed for um, hours protections. And I just managed to meditate through the rotation night during the day. I don't think I could have got through it without meditation. And by the end of uh, that time, I went back again for another retreat. And it was during that retreat that I realized that I should switch what I was focused on and go into psychiatry uh -huh. uh, so that I could focus on understanding how meditation impacts the brain, how it helps us to uh, rewire and change our behaviors and and have a greater capacity for self-regulating. And so that's that's really uh, where my interest came. And I got very interested during the rest of medical school and then in residency on working with addiction because it was the start of the opiate epidemic mm. um, before anyone really was talking about it. But I was seeing it in the work I was doing and had an opportunity to start to to work at the very first place in the country that was offering buprenorphine, which is a medication for opiate use disorder. And I got to see 
people coming alive with the medication and uh, helped co-lead groups. The first time there had been really like groups of people with opiate use disorder in this way. And I was just very interested in how we could potentially bring the insights I was having from the cushion and from the experience uh, to the work that I was doing. I also had the opportunity when I was on one retreat to speak to someone who had been about 20 years in recovery. And he said that, you know, this Vipassana meditation was his AA. And that got me really interested to try to understand how this is working and, you know, and how, it, how it might be helping him both from the clinical research standpoint, but also from a neuroscientific standpoint to try to understand the underpinnings of the way that meditation impacts addiction and behavior change. Um, so I guess after that, I just to bring you up to date, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, after my residency applied to the Summer Research Institute. Yes. Uh, and that was a big, played a big role for me in being able to really begin to focus on meditation research. And so then I was able to do a fellowship focused on meditation, clinical and, and neuroscience related to addiction. And I guess I'd say in that process, I actually, uh, while I was working at the Mass General Hospital and working on uh, research projects, I actually uh, ended up getting quite ill hmm. from uh, pneumonia, uh, which damaged my, my lung at the time. So I suddenly found myself with a chronic illness yeah. And got very interested in how mindfulness could be applied to help support behavior change. Because here I was now 10 years into meditation, intensive meditation, and I felt a bit confused about how to, how to apply it to living with chronic illness. And so a big part of the work that happened was I actually left MGH in 2013 because I was ill and and didn't think I could keep doing this work. Mm. Uh, and uh, really took some time to examine my meditation practice and to think about how it needed to change to be able to help me to be able to navigate living with what, what became a, a pretty severe chronic illness. And so it was in that moment actually, after I had collapsed mm. and my uh, my daughter found me on on the floor and oh um, you know from a, a bilateral pneumonia um, that I actually was off for six weeks and it was during that time that we, I wrote the grants oh my goodness to become the center for mindfulness and compassion wow and I stopped working and and then uh, slowly over time built back up I'm full time again now but uh, it came from from that time of really thinking about what am I doing wrong in my practice and what kind of behavior changes are needed to be able to, to live in a way that's gonna be more skillful with this. And um, anyway, so that, that was 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, despite the fact that I had been told that most people only live four years with the bronchiectasis diagnosis that I had gotten, it's been 10. So I'm feeling glad about that. And it was that experience also that made me realize just how important it was that we integrate mindfulness and compassion into healthcare. And that's the mission of the Center for Mindfulness and Compassion is to integrate mindfulness and compassion into healthcare with a focus on inclusivity, accessibility, diversity, and supporting belonging for all of our communities. So we set out a vision to center mindfulness at the center of the healthcare system specifically within primary care and developed a referral-based insurance reimbursable program for mindfulness for all the sites across the Metro North Boston region at our Cambridge Health Alliance system. So, it, you know, it was a team effort. We had uh, at least 50 people involved and administration involved and tons of grassroots support to be able to make that happen. And uh, that's led to several uh, NIH funded grants to be able to study within the context of that implementation project, the effectiveness of the mindful behavior change intervention, and be able to also start to understand some of the mechanisms involved in mindfulness. You know, at the core of it was in some ways for me, I, I was meditating too hard. 
Hmm. And I couldn't see it. I was a competitive mm-hmm. person. And I, I joked that, you know, I was a competitive meditator <laughs> in, in, until this time. You know, when I sat on the cushion on these retreats, I was thinking about how can I be the one who gets to enlightenment first? <laughs> <laughs> right. And it took me a long time to realize that that wasn't, you know, actually the path of practice. And then it took me a long time to be able to develop the inner compassion or, you know, what Chris Garner and Chris Neff talk about as uh, self-compassion to be able to actually give myself what I needed to be able to care for myself. And so I think it's, it's also in that recognition that we were able to kind of design the Mindful Behavior Change Program, which in research was called Mindfulness Training for Primary Care, was the, the research name for the program. And that's, that's how you'll see it in, in the literature up till now. But um, we wanted to kind of develop a, a, an integration of a typical uh, mindfulness-based program that was based on MBSR and MBCT, but at the same time, integrate threads throughout, explicit threads. There's always been implicit threads of self-compassion and sure. kindness throughout all these programs. And it's almost a hidden curriculum that comes through. We really wanted to figure out how can we make that explicit, but stay true to the mindfulness-based program, but also have threads that focus on behavior change, because that's the core of chronic health and chronic illness. And that's the core of what the healthcare system misses. It's helping people to be able to feel confident and capable in self-managing their chronic illness. And, and then we also wanted to include threads throughout of interpersonal mindfulness and the idea that it's not just about us, but it's about you know uh, interactions with others and with our community. And so we built out an eight week. Um, I say we, because th- there were several of us that worked on the manual and then it's gone through three or four revision phases throughout the, the studies. And we get feedback every year from all the group leaders and continue to to try to improve it, to make sure that it's trauma-informed and, and inclusive, as inclusive as it can be. So, so that's been the, the process we've been engaged in the past decade at CMC as one of our core um, mindfulness programs and that we've been implementing and studying. And so I think that's uh, that's been like one of the main focuses of my my work. We've had the opportunity to now bring that to studying addiction. Um, we've also expanded to, to also do research with MBCT, with depression and built out our clinical services in psychiatry based on, on MBCT. And now we are uh, as well moving into building out research and clinical services related to an internal family systems approach to trauma as a way of trying to address some of the gaps that we saw in in mindfulness programs around how to work with and people who have trauma experiences. And uh, basically all of this work has kind of moved around this, the integration of mindfulness and compassion together um, trying to have ways of teaching mindfulness uh, in a warm way. Yeah. Oh, thanks for sharing all that. Um, That's really powerful, your own personal story, and then how you've been able to weave the learnings from that into into all of these domains. You mentioned, you know, the emphasis on behavior change and how important that is for health and, you know, dealing with illness. I wonder if we could unpack that a little bit more. You know, there's a lens, I think, in our culture, as you said, this is a piece that's missed usually by our medical system. Um, So I think behavior is usually not considered uh, the treatment or what needs to happen. It's so focused on mechanistics and Mm -hmm. pharmaceutical interventions and other things like that. But can you talk a bit more about the role of behavior in these different domains, um, addiction, depression, and chronic illness in your own case and others? Well, I think it's important to say that most of the top 10 reasons for mortality in this country are related to illnesses that are preventable based on behavior change, whether that is reduction of smoking, increasing exercise, changing the way one eats, or even just taking medication regularly. Some analyses have suggested that almost up to 90% of all healthcare costs are related to illnesses that could be prevented 
by uh, behavior change or um, reduced in their impact by behavior changes. So I think that that's important to say that it's a crucially important thing. So when we're talking about behavior change in our studies uh, with folks who have chronic illness, whether it be chronic physical health or chronic mental health disorders, we often are focusing on changes in activity level, um, which is a major, major issue. Changes in what one consumes, both eating and uh, drinking, not just sugary drinks, but alcoholic drinks and, and other types of things. Uh, changes in, in uh, substance use and or drug use, including cigarettes and nicotine, as well as changes in self-care behaviors. So uh, changes in, in our sleep regimens, changes in our medication taking, changes in the things we do to care for ourselves when needed. I would put having a regular mindfulness practice potentially as a self-care behavior. That's important for a lot, a lot of chronic illnesses. Um, in depression, changing behavior has long been shown to be able to make a change. In, in the UK, the first line for depression uh, when you go into a clinic is to get prescribed exercise because uh, behavioral activation has been shown to actually reduce uh, depression outcomes. Now they actually also uh, suggest uh, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy as a first oh, yeah. line as well. So, so as another behavior that one, that one can do. Um, so in depression, that, you know, it clearly makes a difference. Um, and you know, in chronic illness, again, just to kind of connect this with the personal, I measured at one point that there were 14 different behaviors I had to change and do every day in order to not have pneumonia. Wow. Uh, so I think I had like 50 pneumonias over, over 10 years in different times. And all those behaviors were necessary to keep it from returning. And I'm not alone. I think the majority of people in the U.S. have a chronic illness of some sort that they're managing in some way that requires some kind of behavior change to keep its symptoms from returning. And the other half are engaging in behaviors in order to prevent mm. chronic illnesses from arising. So uh, that's why behavior change is so important. And, and finally, you know, what we were talking before we started just about how hot it's been this last week. Yes. Sustainability behaviors are behavior changes that are really necessary from all of us in order to think about how to how to help the the symptoms of our world being out of balance which you know is is uh, climate change so all of these are difficult to change things and the society that you know, we live in at least here in, in the US is supercharged to reward us for engaging in behaviors that are not generally supportive of health or of mental health. And, um, you know, the Surgeon General just came out recently with some concerns about the ways that these phones are, you know, designed to, and media on the phones that we use are designed to capture our attention and change our behavior uh, in ways that seems like are repeatedly being shown are impacting the health and mental health, especially of our teens. So, mm. uh, so I think it is that that focus on thinking about how mindfulness can be potentially a behavior that engages therapeutic neuroplasticity. So that actually can change the brain in positive ways to give us healthier bodies and minds and more capacity for self-efficacy, self-confidence, self-control, whereas many of the other behaviors tend to lead us down a pathway towards more of addictive habit patterns. So I think that, that this is one way that mindfulness is impacting, or at least the, the cultivation of mindfulness over time can impact change. A lot of research is focused on, you know, how does mindfulness change a state? Yes. And that there's folks looking at how it changes traits, like around emotion regulation. But I think the what is it, the, uh, the hidden jackpot, uh, essentially, for all of our health is if we can figure out and understand how we can align mindfulness to actually start to change our capacity to initiate healthy behaviors and to be able to reduce unhealthy behaviors.
You mentioned that a lot of your work, especially earlier in your career, was focused on addiction and substance abuse situations. So maybe that's a a space we can talk about a little bit about how you've um, worked to apply mindfulness and these interventions that you developed in that space and what you've seen. So when I was in training, um, one of my mentors here at Harvard actually suggested that mindfulness wouldn't work for people with addiction because that's the deficit that people have. Uh-huh. And hmm. uh, it was nice. It was like laying down a gauntlet as a challenge for me right. in my research to be <laughs> able to say, can we see if this is true? And can we see how it can be adapted to make it possible for people with an addiction recovery to be able to strengthen their recovery or to stop using? And, uh, and if so, why? And, you know, I've had a lot of colleagues in this process. I was actually at the Summer Research Institute uh, in 2009 with, uh, with Judson Brewer and Eric Garland and Sarah Bowen. And we had a lot of exciting conversations that I think has um, contributed to the work that we've all done, you know, this yeah. past, past decade. And uh, so, I, you know, I started initially back in 2000, was it 2004, I think, uh, working on the first mindfulness intervention that was tested for substance use. It was actually called spiritual self-schema therapy, and it was integrating schema therapy, CBT, with uh, mindfulness and Vipassana meditation. And it was a clinical psychology um, study, but the idea was to engage people's uh, natural interest in spirituality and to engage them with mindfulness and Uh, In fact, at the end, 64% of people were meditating 30 minutes a day. So that really gave me a lot of confidence that it was possible. These were people who were, had a history of opiate use disorder, prescribed methadone, who were still using cocaine and were engaged in high-risk HIV behaviors. And we were able to show that the intervention actually reduced at-risk HIV behaviors. Didn't really change the substance use in a way that we could demonstrate with an effect, but it did change some of the behaviors around putting others at risk, which was impactful. So already that behavior change signal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was interesting in in that regard. And, you know, fast forward to today, we just finished uh, a large national uh, study and and the data has been you know, submitted to a journal where we recruited people from 16 states who had opioid use disorder prescribed buprenorphine. And we were looking at its effects on opioid use, opioid craving, and its effects on anxiety and pain. And I'm excited, you know, I expect in the next few months that that those uh, the results of that study uh, will come out. Um, and in the meantime, colleagues uh, have published uh, results, Eric Garland and Nina Cooperman, and both published results about mindfulness for opiate use with people that have chronic pain, um, demonstrating reductions in chronic pain and reductions in opiate use and opioid craving. So our study is, you know, we have folks with chronic pain in the study, but it's not a chronic pain study. It's for people with an opiate use disorder treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, it'd be the first study that that is enrolling people from, from across the country here in the U.S. So I'm excited about that. It's been a a long process because we started, uh, we were supposed to start on March uh, 14th, 2020. Oh, yes. Um, (laughs) And so the day that we had our launch party was the day before everything shut down in Boston. Oh my gosh. um, Which is what partly allowed this to become a national study uh, of a live online remote mindfulness program. So with every challenge, there's an opportunity. Yes. So that was using um, the mindfulness based uh, behavior change intervention that you're working with in that population? Yeah, so it was adapting the mindful behavior change program and we tried to do it in a way that would be trauma informed and motivationally sensitive so that people would get introduced to a low dose mindfulness intervention after being oriented to to being on group and then would, would have the choice to go through this more intensive uh, you know, mindful behavior change program. So yeah, but we're excited to to get to share some of those results and and you know what we've learned I think is consistent with some of the meta analyses coming out about about substance use. So uh, anyway, that's a, a teaser. I, I, sh- I shouldn't give the results until until it's published, but keep a lookout. Yeah, yeah, so, we will. So um, yeah, so that's been a big part of our our work has been 
trying to to understand and support the use of, of mindfulness uh, in addictions uh, treatment and recovery. And I'd say now it is, um, it's almost the norm for people to have mindfulness as some part of their recovery, especially in for pay programs. So one of the things that I'm focused on right now as the uh, co-chair for the integrative and complementary addiction psychiatry group for the um, for the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry is trying to figure out how can uh, these kinds of interventions that are holistic and empower people to self-manage their own recovery, how can they be accessible, not just in private pay, you know, addiction treatment programs, but across the country for people who are going to uh, community programs uh, that are generally funded by, you know, federal funding or local community funding and uh, where I think it's, it's desperately needed. So it's not something that we're starting to try to pay attention to on, on a national level. Yeah, I love your focus on, you know, having these programs be inclusive. And also you mentioned trauma-informed. And I feel like this is such an important shift kind yeah. of in the whole space is recognizing these needs. Um, I wonder if you could share a little bit about how you think about trauma-informed care now and like what are some of the ways that we need to adapt these programs to work with folks. Yeah, you know, you know I, I want to give a shout out to two people that were really key, uh, Janet Yassin and Barbara Hamm, who uh, worked in the um, Victims of Violence program at CHA, which was one of the very first, if not the first, program for treating community, PTSD community trauma. And so it was founded by uh, Judy Herman back maybe 20, 30 years ago. But we were lucky that two extremely experienced trauma therapists joined our very first cohort of our training. And it was almost every, you know, every session or every other session, they had a comment for the MBSR teachers who were leading saying, hey, this needs to be more trauma informed. And so it was a good dialectic and it's part of what we've tried to do to, to think about how to optimize the mindful behavior change intervention is to you know really listen to the feedback from our group leaders and from our participants and keep changing it. And so you know very early on we we started to embrace kind of the need for it to be trauma informed. You know to ensure that that every group leader knows that there's a possibility that every person who's coming in may have some trauma and that the trauma that that we might be expecting might not be you know who we expecting it to come from and to make sure that there's choice in everything that we do and to bring in a language about how to work with uh, historical traumas and structural traumas and the fact that there are ongoing structural trauma yeah. that people continue to experience and may even be worsened or exacerbated by the structures of groups and by the leadership depending on cultural concordance and to look at the interventions and the cultural symbols that group leaders are bringing in, whether it be the type of bell that they have or the words they use, and try to figure out how to make sure that those words and the symbologies are, if they're there, they're there for a clear reason to and support mindfulness and compassion, but not because of our own kind of backgrounds or how we learned or what our practice was. So to create some consistency in the practices. And then finally, you know, to really bring this concept of window of tolerance into the very beginning of, of our program, um, right? When you talk about mindfulness, you talk about the window of tolerance to help people to be empowered, to be able to self-manage their level of exposure to their own experience. Because part of what trauma is, is getting caught you get caught in experiential avoidance cycle. And for many people, they also get caught in a cycle of shame. And both of those come up right in the very first moments you start practicing. So teaching people where their safe anchors for attention, whether it be touch points with the floor or with the chair, noticing sounds in the room and knowing that you can always go back to these places so that you can, you have control of keeping yourself in the window of tolerance can help a lot. You know, we even uh, had a participant with this association hmm. who participated in our trial and uh, being able to give them choice points um, where they could decide if they want to stay in the room or leave is important. And so 
Minak To uh, recently published a case study about that. I think if you want to find out more about some of the ways we were applying trauma-informed methodologies in our groups, I think that's that's a great one. Um, just to say that that uh, disassociation was you know not an absolute exclusion, and and the participant actually really got a lot out of that and was able to reduce some of the uh, dissociative symptoms and behaviors. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, something else that's coming up for me, just thinking about this whole space, again, uh, you know, your sensitivity and emphasis on working with folks with trauma and also making things accessible to marginalized groups is so needed. I'm also thinking about behavior change and wondering how you hold this space, like the idea of that we need to change our behaviors you know, to be healthy really places the focus and the onus on the individual to be responsible for their health. And I'm thinking of this larger picture that you're bringing up of structural trauma and systems that are in place that it's not really about the individual, right? There's structural oppression and even just things like food systems and other things that are much bigger picture that are influencing health, um, social determinants of health and things like that. So I'm just wondering how you hold that whole space and dynamic in, in your work around behavior change. Well, I want to say two things. One is I do think that uh, we focus on interpersonal mindfulness as well, because being able to identify stakeholders in your change and you know the barriers to your change and being able to communicate those and communicate those assertively mm -hmm. is an important piece of being able to make change. Now, not every change can you communicate about and make a change because it's like on three levels higher than any individual level. And I do think that we still have capacities to be able to be either more resilient in the face of chronic illness or structural illness, societally structural illness, or not. And you know, I think one of the things that I learned from participants in our groups was that the best outcome for mindfulness may not to become more relaxed. And for many folks of color in our in our programs, they said when they started to practice, they just realized you know that there was a deep anger there. Yeah. But mindfulness helped them give voice to that anger. And to be able to do that in an assertive and constructive and effective way, maybe not at the you know ultimate structural level of changing who was president at the time, but being able to uh, do that within the context of communities and even feeling, being able to come more empowered to be able to know that they were safe to speak about what they needed in the group or to tell us that we needed to have more group leaders who you know, spoke Spanish or spoke Portuguese or identified as people of color, which, you know, which we did. Um, and so being able to practice mindfulness may be able to help even in, in that way. But, you know, mindfulness doesn't make things go away. Right. Right. Um, ideally, it helps us to be able to, to navigate the situation and to uh, find our most skillful way towards allowing it to find its ways to change. So I think that in that way, it, it's helpful, but it might not change right away. Yeah. And I should say one other thing is that discrimination uh, experiences are a activating factor and cue for substance use and for other health behaviors that may be um, harmful to self. So being able to be aware of the way that we react to discrimination experiences may be able to, it does, can't change those experiences, can't change the the impact that it has on us maybe emotionally, but it might give us a space to be able to recognize the impact it's having us on emotionally instead of turning towards other things that just harm us more. So, and I, I think that that's true both for, you know, I hear that among people that are practicing from communities of color, but other minoritized groups as well. And, you know, that is the impact of uh, the way that um, subordination leads to substance use. And brain studies have demonstrated in uh, animal models as well that subordination in social contexts increases substance use and other types of reinforcing behaviors.
I want to talk a little bit about also your work in depression. I know you've expanded into that space too, as you said, uh, adapting MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and integrating your work in this behavior change intervention. Um, so maybe you could share a bit about what you've learned in the depression space. Well, I've just been really impressed by the level of evidence that has been developed in the mindfulness-based cognitive therapy interventions, both within the U.S. and internationally, uh, with some amazing uh, studies being conducted in the U.K., basically demonstrating that it's a cost-effective uh, solution for depression and that it's about as, as good as uh, being prescribed an antidepressant and staying on an antidepressant. So I think that that data is important and should be impacting all public health systems, not just in the UK. But one of the problems that even the UK is having is how do you develop a workforce that can then provide that once you identify that is necessary. And so... You mean having enough teachers to deliver these interventions? Yeah, yeah have enough teachers that are really mean having enough processes for patients to be able to get to teachers. Mm -hmm. And so what we did starting in, I think, 2017, you know, we had been running mindfulness in primary care and having a lot of positive impacts, but there were a lot of people that are getting excluded from the primary care programs because there were certain exclusions for um, higher levels of psychiatric symptoms. Oh. And one of the things that we got concerned about was that a lot of those folks were people of color. And we wanted to make sure that we were, as a system, uh, making mindfulness accessible to anybody who wanted it. And so that really was our impulse to start the Mindful Mental Health Service. And it's also a referral-based service in our healthcare system uh, that gets referrals from 12 different primary care sites, as well as from the outpatient psychiatry department and, and other psychiatry clinics. We do a uh, complete you know, evaluation, integrative psychiatric evaluation from a mindfulness and compassion perspective. And then we help get people connected to the right groups. And we created a mindfulness continuum of care that starts with introduction to mindfulness groups, which are inspired by the MBI practices, but again, are designed to be even more trauma sensitive and trauma informed with the practices and they're shorter. And it's really about helping people to get used to being in a group and maybe giving them time for their medication to be able to start to uh, reduce symptoms, um, to develop some behaviors around being able to participate in a group online. And then uh, people can basically move up into our MBCT groups. And we've just had a lot of people that have had, you know, benefit from MBCT groups, you know, or that the mindful behavior change groups. And then once they complete those, an eight-week group, then they're able to apply for our, our strength in your practice groups. And we have actually three full groups, group psychotherapy running and strengthening your practice, which is designed because even at the end of eight weeks, people often are still caught around something especially people that have had significant mental illness. And this gives us a chance to be able to help people problem solve, um, to learn new practices, to develop a deeper way of thinking about it. So about 20% of patients after MBCT end up going on. And the good news there is about 80% of people don't feel like they need anything else. But, and at the same time, the strength in your practice groups are really helpful for those that want to continue. And for many people, it allows them to not, you know, need ongoing individual therapy or other types of things that where there's difficulties to access in the healthcare system. So uh, we also started during the pandemic, the CHA MindWell program, which has had 2000 people register, which uh, allows people to every two months to complete uh, online computerized adaptive tests that assesses eight different types of, of symptoms of diagnoses for mental health. And if there are increases, then they're able to get triaged to get a quick assessment and then be able to get referred if it's appropriate to um, one of these groups. And if not, uh, you know, if they need more to get sent to, you know, psycho farm or, or emergency room. But what we've demonstrated uh, over three to six months, we see it was a small effect, but we see a small you know, reduction both in anxiety, depression, and in PTSD just from being in the Mindwell program and mm. you know, doing the assessments, being able to have someone to talk to, being able to be referred to mindfulness. And we send out a monthly Mindwell newsletter that is focused on some aspect of self-management of mental health, mental wellness. So, you know, 
it looks like about 60% of people read those, which if you think about from a, a population standpoint, if that kind of thing can continue to grow, then we can have healthcare systems that are not just waiting for people to come in when we have this massive shortage of mental health care providers and massive shortage of primary care providers that where their time is often taken up by working with mental health. But we can actually be proactive in helping people who want to take some initiative in their mental wellness, but don't know how to yeah. be able to do that in a way that also allows them to connect um, quickly, you know, at the moment when it's needed. So that that's kind of another innovative program that was supported by NIH during the pandemic that we were able to to deliver. Very cool. Um, I know you've done some work too. You've had some interesting findings around the role of the body. And I feel like that's something that comes up on this show a lot in so many different domains and the role of our ability to to sense our body and bodily signals in depression. I heard you give a lecture on some great results there. So could you share a little bit about that? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I've been interested in the, the role of the body from the from the very beginning, as you, as you heard, where my, my practice started with, you know, basically with the body scan practice. Right. And, and uh, as one refines attention and becomes more aware of subtle body sensations, both inside and outside the body, it seems to change, you know, people's emotional reactivity, their capacity for emotional differentiation to be able to, to, be able to understand emotions more clearly by noticing the physical patterns that emotions have. We also can experience craving in the body and notice earlier signs of craving to be able to make changes. And so we started to really look at interception early on as one of the targets of our science of behavior change grant. And I should say, we actually, we, we did two studies. So one that was focused on chronic illness and with anxiety and depression uh, and stress disorder comorbidity. And, and the other was uh, led by Eric Lux at Brown that was focused on mindfulness for hypertension. And so we used the same measures to be able to kind of triangulate to mindfulness appropriately. And we early on identified the Maya, which is the multidimensional assessment of interceptive awareness. Uh, and interceptive awareness is the awareness of internal body sensations and the ways that we relate to or respond to those internal body sensations. Mm. I should say that interception is the ability to notice these internal body sensations, especially body sensations related to our maintaining homeostasis or balance, uh, which all use similar neural pathways to come up the spinal cord and, and come to the brain. And they come to this part of the brain that's called the insula or the island between the frontal and parietal lobes. And when I was in medical school, we didn't even learn that it existed. <laughs> oh my. Uh, but it turns out it's probably one of the most important things for um, both body awareness, for pain, for, um, for emotion regulation, and for attention and salience. So um, been very interested in, in the insula from, from early on. And so this interceptive pathways, uh, there's both this kind of narrow view of interception as just being a sensory process of receiving sensations from the body. But there's a much broader way of thinking about interception or interceptive awareness, interceptive regulation that is about how do you also appraise or relate to these body sensations as they arise? And then how do you regulate these body sensations? Do you do it by trying to avoid the body sensations and trying to change them? Or do you try to change your perception of the way that your body should be and bring your sense of, of what the body state should be to whatever it is, mm -hmm. which is essentially what mindfulness is doing. It's you know paying attention to body sensations in a non-judgmental way, allowing it to be as it is. And that reduces the kind of brain's predictive error that would otherwise um, motivate change. So when our brain senses that our body state isn't the way it thinks it should be, the difference between those two states is often what leads to a brain's motivation to then do something to, to either have an emotion which moves us into motion or to move us into some kind of behavior. So in mindfulness, our interceptive regulation technique is perceptual inference or to be with whatever the body state is as it changes. And that's a very effective way to do that. So all of these pieces come together 
into a broader definition of interception. And interceptive awareness is a kind of a subjective way of measuring these different ways that people relate to their body and body sensations, especially internal body sensations. So our studies have suggested, both the two studies I discussed before, demonstrated that there were increases in interceptive awareness uh, after eight weeks of mindfulness mm. uh, with large effect sizes. And one of the things that we found that was interesting was particularly among depression, there have been studies that have demonstrated previously, neuroimaging studies, that when people are paying attention to their body, that the insula activation is impaired during depression. Mm. And it's thought that one of the things that happens during depression is people get so into their head with their thoughts, they get more and more disconnected from their body. And there have been other studies that have demonstrated that when you ask people to feel where they have emotions in their body, there are reliable places in the body where people feel different emotions. People feel, you know, pride in their cheeks and in their chest. People feel anger in their fists <laughs> and, and, and in their chests. Um, people feel shame in their in their cheeks. If you think about cheek flushing or anxiety, it, often people feel it in their belly. Everyone's different, but in general, you see these kinds of patterns that people feel this way. The only emotion that doesn't have any sensory experience with it is depression, where people actually have an absence of emotion. Oh, interesting. And it's thought that there's probably some kind of impact in like the signal to noise ratio that happens during, as part of depression, where there's interceptive dysregulation and then people can't feel their body. Right. Now I said before that emotion, part of what's key about emotion is that there's both thoughts that are associated with emotions, there's body sensations that are associated with emotions, and there's action urges that are associated with emotions. And that's partly because when you feel something in the body that's not the way that it should be, it helps to motivate us into action. And there's an action urge that, that often comes with it. And so in depression, people end up having intercepted dysregulation. They have less sensation in their body. They're not feeling anything. And therefore they also become amotivated. They have alexithymia, more difficulty explaining what they're feeling. And they often end up having more and more inactivity right. because they don't have the body sensations to motivate them to move or to get up and to do things. And it becomes a cycle. And so we actually found in one of our studies that people with depression, that depression severity actually correlated with the lack of body trust hmm. that people had, that their body wasn't a safe place, that they couldn't trust the signals coming from their body. And then we found that people also tended to listen to their body less mm -hmm. um, and notice body sensations less as depression severity increased. If you think about trauma and anxiety and depression and how often they are comorbid, I would hypothesize that as anxiety increases and as people have traumatic responses, they become less and less like they can trust their body. And then the brain uh, maybe moves into then into depression but then you get stuck in depression because it's hard to motivate to get out of depression without having body sensations that tell you what's good for you. Right. That eating is something I need, that exercise is something that feels good. And then people fall deeper in, into depression. So one of the things that we found in our neuroimaging studies was that as body trust increased during a mindful behavior change program, that people's brains in their insula actually increased among those who were depressed, not among those who were just anxious, mm. but those who had depression, we actually were able to see this kind of correction in interceptive dysregulation, this increase in people's capacity to feel their bodies, and that that seemed to be linked to the increase in body trust that they were experiencing. We also found that the increase in body trust among people who were depressed, in addition to increases in body listen, predicted people's ability to make a change over those eight weeks, wow. make, a, make a behavioral change. We found that people increased their odds of making a behavior change by about three times if they were in the mindfulness group versus just in a one hour mindfulness program versus the you know 16 hour or 20 hour mindful behavior change program if you include the retreat. And that change was not fully mediated, but was partially mediated by this increase in interceptive awareness by increasing body trust in particular, oh, fascinating. especially among the depressed. So I think that that's, a, that's an important thing. We know that, you know, if you've done practice, 
and you've had change, then then that intuitively makes sense that like, if I learn how to listen to my body and I listen to what my body needs, that I'll be able to make behavior change. But yet it's never really been shown before. So I think it's an important thing for us to to recognize that and that a mindfulness program that's designed designed towards behavior change that actually does help people catalyze behavior change even around difficult, you know, behaviors related to to chronic illness and even among people with anxiety and depression. In fact, perhaps particularly among people who have depression. So I think that that's a, you know, that's an area obviously for further research and we're thinking about how to apply that to different specific chronic illnesses now and, and looking for collaborators who may be interested in applying the intervention specifically to different chronic illness types in multi-site trials. That's really exciting that you've been able to draw those links. So it's such beautiful work to go from the conceptual frame and knowing that interoception and these bodily signals are, it's a problem in depression. And then your intervention, both showing the outcomes subjectively and clinically for the participants that they developed an increase in ability to trust their body or experience their body. And then it correlates with brain changes that you might expect. So that's beautiful. I think that is a really critical mechanism underlying, you know, some of the impacts of these practices. Yes, I, I think so. And and we also found that uh, consistently in all of our studies that emotion regulation, that there are reductions in maladaptive emotion regulation with the, you know, with the mindful behavior change program. And so I think that's also playing a role, especially around regulating around goal-directed behaviors and emotions, emotional expression. So I think there's more work to be done, but you know, from this first decade, I'm very excited about what we've what we've done in this area, and and I'm looking forward to to seeing how it applies um, when applied to other specific chronic illness behaviors. But you know, I did want to say that the focus on trauma is something that uh, by making a trauma informed intervention and enrolling people that have trauma, you know, within our programs. I think we're actually probably able to get closer to what actually will be implementable and impactful in healthcare systems. And so that, that's been the goal from the outset. And in fact, in our final version of the trial, we did three RCTs as part of the implementation. And the final one, the biggest predictor of behavior change in our study, which surprised me, we looked at it several times, was whether or not people had PTSD. Oh, wow. So everybody who had previously identified themselves as having PTSD made a change. Now, so maybe that speaks to the, the fact that if you design a program that's trauma-informed and people identify it in advance, that they are people who are gonna be able to make a change. Now, I think one of the challenges is the people that did the worst in making a change were people who had anxiety NOS, not otherwise specified. It's mm. actually, this isn't a significant finding. So I would say um, this is exploratory, but it got me very interested because in general, when I think about what is anxiety not otherwise specified, it's people that have anxiety for a reason that the clinicians don't really understand. And what is that often? Well, that often is a trauma that the person either isn't talking about or hasn't fully understood themselves. Right. And so I think that actually made me concerned. And it said that, that this is helpful. We continue to commit to the work that we're doing, but we also need to have interventions that can support people with PTSD and people with trauma who aren't even at the place where they can you know, talk about it. Yes. And to make sure that we can do it safely. And so that was kind of when I started this, this journey to really look at doing research with internal family systems. Mm. I don't know how much you know about that or your... Yeah, internal family systems, I think is such a fascinating um, approach, but I don't think we've talked about it very much on the show. So maybe you could give just a little overview. So internal family systems is a holistic approach to mental health that was started by Richard Schwartz, who actually um, started as a family therapist and uh, used some of the ideas around family therapy 
and working with groups within families mm -hmm. and power structures within families to be able to then look inside and to understand the ways that our internal life works and to be able to navigate them using some of these techniques that were designed in family therapy. So it's important to say internal family systems is not really about working externally with families. Right. It's really about working inside with uh, what he called parts, um, or parts of ourself. So the idea is that, and the way I came to this actually was partly through my interest in self-related processes and the way that we do selfing, that every experience that we have is not just this experience, but it's also our brain starts relating to it and starts, starts having some ownership over the fact that I'm having this experience. Mm -hmm. So the thoughts that we have, the feelings that we have that we see coming and going within the context of like a mindfulness practice are often being associated as I'm having this experience. And so what can happen over time is that we develop almost like sub-personalities. I don't know if you saw Inside Out, but I think it was actually partly based on IFS, but this idea that we develop a, uh, you know, a part that's been traumatized. We have, a, we have a part that's a protective part that engages thoughts, feelings around protection and managing. We also have in the context firefighter parts that might come in to rescue when a part that is, you know, an exiled traumatized part is activated to come in and rescue from whatever feelings that might be emerging in the mind. And so what happens is it posits from the very start that there's a multiplicity of selves, um, of parts in the mind. And I wouldn't say that these are not um, selves with a big S but they are these limited senses of self, these momentary senses of self that would actually change if we didn't identify with them hmm. and blend with them. And it's when we do that, as opposed to being able to be mindfully and compassionately noticing them and letting them arise, letting them pass, but we instill with them jobs within our mind and then they go at that and they stick around. And the more we have of them, the more they come into conflict with each other. And in fact, maybe they're in conflict because they solved some good problems when, they, when we were younger, but then they stay around and often the ones that are protected and are managing are ones that are engaged in something that's really either harming us or exhausting us because they're working so hard to try to be good. And if we're able to start to notice them, then perhaps, perhaps all of this, these thoughts, that are just arising and passing that have no meaning may within this context sometimes have a meaning and actually lead us through a trailhead to be able to understand that we were selfing around a lot of these different aspects of our experience of our thoughts our body sensations the emotions we were having that were arising and that were actually caught up in a I would say almost like a mini sense of self. So if you think of anatta or the Pali word for no self in Buddhism, there are a lot of similarities here, but instead of getting to it at the end of an eight week program, or let's say at the end of a 30 day uh, intensive meditation process, what IFS does is it rapidly in the first session changes the way we conceptualize, the way we self experience. And we start to see that we have lots of parts and we can have those parts without it being all of us. And in fact, we can welcome every part. All parts are welcome. And that gets at the internal shame and shaming, shaming parts that often are incredibly common in many people and get in the way of actually starting meditation hmm. um, for a lot of people. And when you've had trauma, they may be, you know, one of the primary protective parts trying to keep you from being, from having people know or to be in that shameful, you know, position again, or maybe feeling like it was your fault and not wanting to put yourself in a position where it might be your fault again. Whatever it might be, these are the kind of thoughts that can come up to realize that those thoughts don't have to leave, but they also don't have to dominate that there's space for all the parts. So in sometimes in meditation, we can have a fantasy that we're gonna start meditating and all of our bad thoughts are gonna go away or they're gonna come and they're gonna pass and they're really gonna pass, right? <laughs> right? But what the internal family system approach is doing is saying, actually, they don't need to pass. They just need to not dominate. They can be part of the internal family of parts. 
and they're welcome. And what happens is usually when they feel fully welcomed in and we can warmly be with all of our experiences and all of our parts of ourselves and all of these parts that we identify with, then we can actually heal internally. And we see even people that have had an incredible amounts of trauma be able to feel like they've been changed and that they're able to now work with and be with their, their parts. So there was a study by Hillary Hodgson that was done with, you know, like the top IFS therapists in the country in their private practice with people with severe trauma. And it showed like a massive effect size reduction in people with PTSD. I think it was a Cohen's D of 4.0 reduction. Yeah. And so if you're a scientist, you know, that's really big. That's like physics level big, or maybe not yeah. quite physics, but almost physics. And so that got me interested. I said, how can that be? And, you know, it's probably because it was in private practice with, you know, middle to upper class, generally white women. Like we need to do this in a uh, diverse healthcare system of people who are primarily, you know, on subsidized health, health insurance. And we need to do it in a way that's not individual care because, you know, who can get 16 weeks of 90 minute individual care? And so we designed a system with 90 minute groups for 16 weeks and eight hours of, of individual counseling, which we mainly did for safety because we just weren't sure how this would work when we got started with a group approach. And overall, it's been really impressive. We actually just had a publication in the APA's flagship uh, trauma journal, the um, it's called Psychological Trauma, you know, just demonstrating that it's incredibly acceptable for, for patients. And we do see in our exploratory analyses that there were uh, reductions in PTSD symptoms using uh, clinician administered scales. We also saw reductions in anxiety, depression, in suicide risk, and we saw increases in decentering. So I think, you know, part of what you're doing when you are identifying things as parts is being able to gain that kind of meta cognitive awareness of this not being me and not, and not being caught up in it, not being blended with it is the word that they use in IFS. So then you're able to see it and be able to be compassionate towards it. We found that self-compassion increased because what's happening when you're welcoming in all these different parts of you, you really are harnessing inner compassion. Um, and we saw um, big reductions in maladaptive emotion regulation. So it was interesting. It's very similar to what we're seeing in mindfulness programs, what we're seeing in people with severe and high levels of trauma. Trauma loads of at least seven events was our average mean. And among diverse populations with people feeling um, welcomed because, you know, the parts that you mentioned, the structural and historical traumas, those structural and historical traumas are often experienced as burdens for, you know, by specific parts. And so IFS works with that. And I think that's made it a, a very safe and attractive format for people from all different cultures, at least to date. So, you know, we're still doing research. We've got, we've got several other studies that, that are happening, but I'm excited about this. And we've, we've seen enough in our data, even the unpublished data that, you know, that, that was coming out soon as well to be able to uh, start the first, um, you know, IFS clinical service. So we're doing a parts service as part of our mindful mental health service. So when people have high levels of trauma, instead of having them go right into MBCT, we have them um, start with our IFS program. Oh, with the that's parts great. Programs. That's great. I love the way that um, this perspective of IFS and the way you were just explaining it really brings together these ideas of no self or kind of like loosening that tight idea of self that, um, you know, of course, Buddhism names as such a central cause of suffering. Yeah. And also the real, um, I'm seeing this from so many different places coming up, that need for acceptance, right? And self-compassion, as you said, and kind of that stance of welcoming all of the things that come up in our experience and how healing that can be. Yeah, I'm thinking of David Cresswell's work, uh, looking at the relevance of acceptance. And mm -hmm. Sokni Rinpoche um, has a practice called handshake practice, which is really about the same, creating that same stance of, of welcoming and warmth. So, well, Zeb, this has really been so wonderful to chat. And um, I know we're coming up on our time, but is there anything that you wanted to share as we're wrapping up? Well, I, I guess I would just encourage people if they're interested in the work we're doing to to go to our website at the Center for Mindfulness and Compassion. We are doing a um, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy teacher training intensive this fall. And, you know, again, I guess I'll say this in, in line with our goals for accessibility 
um, you know, we're trying something new after leading five intensive trainings to be able to do both an in-person three-day training and then you know, have flexibility around scheduling some evening online groups. So we're really trying not just in our programs, but also when thinking about how to making this accessible for busy clinicians in healthcare, um, for diverse clinicians, um, to be able to have a kind of welcoming place to be able to train and develop mindfulness. I think that we've seen that a lot of early adopters across the healthcare system have done mindfulness training, but a lot of people have gotten a stymied in actually implementing it in their healthcare system or have given up on that because it felt like it was too difficult in their healthcare system. And then a lot of other folks, you know, just didn't feel like it could be for them because, you know, it requires such an intense kind of startup to be able to commit to becoming an MBI instructor. So we're trying to make our instructor training programs more accessible so people, I hope, can check them out. And we've also started just this year our first Mindful Healthcare Scholars program, which is focused on identifying emerging leaders who want to integrate mindfulness into their healthcare system. Oh, great. Or their mental health system or their substance use uh, treatment program, but just need the skills and the support to be able to both um, figure out what's the right training for them to develop their own skills if they want to teach as a teacher or or if not, how to identify and get connected to good teachers. And then maybe the even more difficult thing is like how to figure out how to navigate the healthcare system. Um, oh my gosh. You have to, I have to say we're fairly US focused because that's where we've been working, but it's also where the, the healthcare system is maybe the most difficult to, to navigate. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, how do you make insurance reimbursable mindfulness programs that are sustainable, both in primary care and mental health and substance use treatment? How do you align with stakeholders in your healthcare system and be able to get buy-in from everybody from the very top all the way down to the, you know, the front desk staff who have to check people in, 12 people in at a time. And so, you know, we've done that. We've worked across CHA, you know, across multiple different sites to be able to do that. We've been working with other healthcare systems, both locally and, and, and others in other states. And this is kind of a way that we're hoping to create a yearly program for the year where we support emerging leaders to do that um, in their healthcare systems and implement a project. So, Fantastic. you know, it'll be interesting and come back in a year and, and tell you how that goes. Uh, but if that's successful, then we're hoping that it can be a model for helping to support um, this, not just in research, but really in, in the true healthcare system um, in all the different ways that it helps to take care of patients. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Zev, for taking the time today to share all this great work with us. And thank you for everything that you're doing in this space. Um, it's been really great to chat. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This episode was edited and produced by me and Phil Walker. And music on the show is from Blue Dot Sessions and Universal. Show notes and resources for this and other episodes can be found at podcast.mindandlife.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts and share it with a friend. And if something in this conversation sparked insight for you, let us know. You can send an email or voice memo to podcast at mindandlife.org. Mind and Life is a production of the Mind and Life Institute. Visit us at mindandlife.org, where you can learn more about how we bridge science and contemplative wisdom to foster insight and inspire action towards flourishing. If you value these conversations, please consider supporting the show. You can make a donation at mindandlife.org under support. Any amount is so appreciated and it really helps us create this show. Thank you for listening. <laughs>